I, I have discovered at the museum that when they say they closed at four, they do not mean we close the door at four and you finish looking around and then get to leave. They mean you're out at four. Um, and so given, given my knowledge of all the knowledge I have learned about museum practice, including that, um, I'm going to try and start us on time and keep us on time as we go. Can you all hear me okay? Is this working? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, and you can see my sunny smiling face because I have temporarily taken off my mask. Welcome to our symposium on the work of Hal Fisher. My name is Tim Dean and I teach in the English department here at Illinois. For those of you who don't know. The Cranet Art Museum has kindly let me loose over here, and I am grateful for their indulgence of an interloper. But because we are all, to some extent, interlopers in this place, I want to begin today's proceedings with a land acknowledgement. Cranet Art Museum, as part of the University of Illinois, stands on the lands of the Peoria, Kakaskia, Plankashore, Weir, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawa, Potawa, Potawaomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of those indigenous nations prior to their forced removal, and they continue to carry the stories of those nations and their struggles for survival and identity today. As part of a land-grant institution dedicated to promoting the critical power of art of the past and present, Cranet Art Museum has a responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this university over the last 150 years. We also recognize the particular role images have played in this history. Using our collections, programming, and collaborative relationships, we seek to address and reflect on these histories and the role that the University of Illinois continues to play in shaping them. With that proviso in mind, welcome. And thank you for showing up so early on a Saturday morning. This is a time when ordinarily I would be sound asleep. Thanks especially to our international speakers who have traveled a tremendous distance to be here at a time when international travel is unusually hair-raising. The Biden administration lifts its travel restrictions in two days time on Monday, November 8th. So we've been a little ahead of the curve. I won't say smuggling was involved, but people got here. Okay, I admit it was madness to envision an in-person symposium during a global pandemic. But I still believe that one gains something particular and unique by seeing Hal Fisher's art on the gallery wall, rather than just on a screen, and by gathering in person to discuss it. Owing to the vagaries of his career and some idiosyncrasies of art history, Hal Fisher's photography has not received the kind of substantive critical attention it deserves. This symposium and the exhibition it accompanies are designed to redress that deficit. We are extremely fortunate to have Hal present here today, and I'm grateful that all the brilliant scholars whom I invited to discuss his work said yes immediately. That tells you something too. Despite its being produced in the 1970s, Hal's photography has not been discussed in this concerted a fashion until today. We are in for something exciting and truly new. And I have a little bit of housekeeping I need to do. I need to tell you that as part of Cranet Art Museum's commitment to access, our symposium features live cart captioning typed by captioners who are listening remotely to today's events. <laughs> Big Brother is listening. 
If anyone would like a written transcript of the symposium at the conclusion, please let me or Amy Powell know. I would ask everyone who uses the microphone to be mindful that the captioners need to be able to keep pace with your speaking. During Q&A, if, if everyone could preface their questions by saying their name, that would help the captioners too. We are gathering in a space where virtually everyone is vaccinated, but university policy requires that we stay masked unless eating or drinking, or I should add, standing right here. Um, thank you for being here, truly, and for bearing with the various challenges entailed by an in-person event. Before I introduce our first speaker, I want to thank everyone who has made this event possible. First and foremost, we thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, which awarded us the grant that funds the symposium. They came through with the cash at a moment when museums worldwide are struggling. Second, I'd like to thank Robert and Sonia Carringer, whose Art Acquisitions Fund helped support the Hal Fisher exhibition currently on display upstairs. Next, I want to thank everyone at the Cranet Art Museum, especially its director, John Seidel, and curator, Amy Powell, for inviting me to serve as guest curator and for supporting this symposium. Amy has been particularly helpful with all of today's technology logistics, which, as those of you who know me know, consistently defeat me. And I'm just sorry that illness has prevented Amy from being here in person, but you may have heard her voice, her spirit is present in the room. Chris Shady, the museum's administrative assistant, has gone above and beyond with the many arrangements needed to make an event like this work. Thank you all. My colleagues in the English department's creative writing program, especially Corey Van Landingham and Jody Stanley, have been wonderful collaborators in using Hal's photographs as inspiration for an ekphrastic poetry competition run by our local literary magazine, Ninth Letter. You will hear more about this from Corey before the lunch break, but I wanted to thank those colleagues for all their help. And to give a shout out to Caden Henningson, a doctoral student in the English department who has used his fabulous trans queer letterpress, which is called Meanwhile, to produce handmade broadsides of the winning poems. Finally, I need to acknowledge the James M. Benson Professorship at the University of Illinois, which generously supports all of my work here. Mr. Benson is still alive, but he maintains an enigmatic distance, and we have never met. He went remote before the pandemic. Now I'm about to introduce our first speaker, who has just left the building, who has just run out of the room. Um, <laughs> so I wrote this for him to hear, and he has just left. Um, <laughs> what can I do? Um, <laughs> he can get a copy. Wait, do you think I should wait a moment? He's probably just gone to the men's room, right? Um, <laughs> as opposed to decided against giving his paper <laughs> after all. Um, this is where I get to ad lib and the captioners can make the best of my bad jokes and horrible accent as they, as they wish. Um, but seriously, I'm very, I really appreciate you coming here. It's, an, it's early, it's early and um, it's a Saturday and um, we're not used to gathering in person, but I'm glad that we are. Okay. Without further ado, let me introduce our opening speaker. After some heroic travel and maybe a trip to the bathroom, <laughs> Dr. Peter Rayberg joins us from Berlin, where he is head of collections and archives of the Schulis Museum. He holds a PhD in German literature from NYU and has taught at Cornell University, Brown University, Northwestern, the University of Texas at Austin, and at our neighboring institution, the University of Illinois at Chicago, 
where he served as Max Cade Professor in 2018. In addition to his role as an academic and now as a museum professional, Peter has worked extensively as a journalist in Germany, as a, prof as a professional translator, and as what here in the United States we call a creative writer, with two novels and a book of short stories to his name. Clearly, Dr. Rayberg has cross-disciplinary expertise and is adept at writing across many different genres. He has an especially sharp eye for ripples in the queer landscape internationally, and he is highly attuned to new formations in popular culture, particularly queer visual culture and pornography. In 2018, Peter published a book titled Hipster Porn, which will appear in English translation next spring under the title Queer Masculinities and Affective Sexualities, Hipster Porn and the Fanzine Butt. It's a double T. <laughs> His scholarly attention to Butt magazine suggests that Peter, like Hal Fisher, has a keenly ironic sense of humor about the foibles of male same-sex desire. You have to laugh. One of the most striking aspects of Butt magazine, and one that licenses Peter's use of the term post-pornography, is its promotion of an aesthetic of the radically imperfect body. Butt represents a visual experiment in de-idealization, and Peter shows how, more than merely entertainment for men, the magazine represents an experiment also in thinking. Given the range and distinction of his previous work, I'm excited to hear Peter's perspective on exhibiting gay masculinities now, and to think with him about the ongoing life of Hal Fisher's work. Please join me in welcoming to Champagne, Dr. Peter Rayberg. with a microphone while I'm sitting? Okay. Um, thank you, Tim, for the very kind introduction. This table is really high. It's, I feel like... <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here, which was a bit of a challenge after 16 hours of um, traveling. Um, I'm really happy to, to get the occasion to talk about Hal's work, and I already uh, told uh, Hal yesterday that I didn't find it easy <laughs> to speak about it or to find an entry point because the images are so ubiquitous, and um, sometimes I felt a lot of things, even if they have not been worked through scholarly, are uh, circulating as comments about them that I found it a challenge to really add something new. And I'm trying to look at this... Um, also as an academic, but also from the perspective of uh, museums' praxis and producing exhibitions. And I want to somehow come to terms with the, with the question of what is the position of uh, health work in the current um, exhibition landscape. In 2015, Schwules Museum in Berlin, the gay museum, or you could also translate it as queer, in some sense, uh, Schwul is queerer than queer in the German-speaking context, but that's a longer discussion. Schwules Museum in Berlin had its most important exhibition to date. Together with the German Historical Museum, DHM, which had been established after German reunification as a place of national self-understanding, it presented the exhibition Homosexualitäten, Homosexualities. Um, and here you see the, the picture of performance artist uh, Cassis as a model. In the DHM, the historical part was shown, the history of Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Sciences and the history of Paragraph 175 in Germany, especially its consequences during the 12 years of Nazi rule, for example. In the space of Schwules Museum itself, as the second venue of the exhibition, a number of artistic positions were on display. The plural, homosexualities, appears as a gesture of diversification, which at the same time intended to denounce the secret equation of homosexuality and male homosexuality, based, of course, amongst other things, on legal history. 
in one chapter of uh, homosexualities, and you see this here on the slide, a wild knowledge was presented to revisit established queer historiographies. Alphabetical keywords were selected and illustrated by diverse images and objects. With this equally conventional and arbitrary mixing up of queer knowledge, previous canonizations were supposed to be questioned. I was not yet employed by Schulis Museum at that time. However, in preparation for the exhibition, I met with the board and one of the curators of the show. I was asked if I thought that Tom of Finland should be represented in homosexualities. Schulis Museum holds, amongst other things, one of it, his uh, drawings. A number of considerations tied in with this question. Was the show about presenting the greatest hits of a lesbian, gay, trans art and cultural history, or helping a previously uh, less considered queer history to gain visibility? Did the exhibition have a national, or as it is often the case for queer exhibitions, a transnational focus? Was it aimed primarily at a mainstream audience or at the LGBTQI community? The decision of the curatorial team was against Tom of Finland. Paul Fisher was not in the exhibition either. The suspicion that the lack of appreciation for gay masculinities in the current queer context, especially when they are presented in a sexualized or hypersexualized way, was the deciding factor here, could not be entire, entirely dispelled for me, yet the decision can also be read, thinking a little bit more generously and less paranoid, as an effect of the mainstreaming of Tom of Finland. Tom of Finland had become so popular that there was no need to give him a place in a queer context. He was already everywhere else. To say that Tom of Finland is part of a gay canon is an understatement. Beyond a queer reception, his drawings enjoy pop cultural ubiquity and are part of the archive of 20th century Western art. They are part of the MoMA collection. Recently, Tom of Finland's work has also been shown, for example, in two major exhibitions in Berlin. And most importantly, perhaps over the past 25 years, several uh, books have been published by Taschen, including The Art of Pleasure in 98 and Tom of Finland XXL in 2009. Hal Fischer has not yet received this kind of honor. I mean, being uh, published by Taschen, although I think that would be a great idea. However, his work is also famously re represented in MoMA's collection, and no contemporary exhibition on masculinity is without it. Such as the major exhibition, Masculinities, Liberation Through Photography, that ran in London and Berlin in 2019 and 2020 and just opened in Antwerp, and where Fischer is represented by several photographs from the gay semiotic project. Tom of Finland was not here. Now there's the big Hall Fisher work show here at the Cranard Art Museum with more stops to come soon, hopefully. I compare Tom of Finland and Hal Fisher here at the beginning of my talk to think about the images of gay masculinity in current exhibitions. Which artists have managed to become part of the international exhibition business? Where are they exhibited? Is it possible to make a meaningful distinction between mainstream and queer here? What place do Hal Fisher's photographs have in a queer context? How can we assess the cultural and or subcultural meaning of these images today? These questions all need further discussion. My attempt here is to start thinking about how to address them. I do not so much want to trace the track record of individual artists, but rather ask which forms of gay masculinity and what body politics have achieved visibility in the exhibition business, in the collections of institutions and also beyond in the media, under what conditions and to what ends. In terms of exhibition politics, I want to suggest that the clone, which after Stonewall had become the guiding image in Western urban gay scenes in the 1970s, has made a career for himself. It is true that an exhibition like Masculinities, for example, is dedicated precisely to the diversity of masculine styles, which demonstrates that an alternative tradition, ranging from Walter Pfeiffer, uh, Peter Huja, uh, Mark Morris Road, to Wolfgang Tillmans and Paul Sepuya, um, and this is uh, Paul Sepuya in a, here on the wall to the left, uh, in an exhibition I curated uh, this year in Berlin called uh, Intimacy. There's also a work by John Paul Rico, by the way, here on the right side, which you see on the slide. Um, so, uh, so uh, Morriso, Tillmans, and the others, and Tsipuya follow less the codes of a sexual gay infrastructure, but puts, for example, male vulnerability into the picture. Um, and this tradition has, without question, found its place in the history and art of art and photography as well. 
But the masculine glamour of Tom of Finland and Hal Fisher, whose representations of masculinity are as unambiguous as they are self-reflexive, surely defend their regular place here and have gained mythical status. What explains the success of a certain gay style and body type? Why have clones made it into the museum? What meaning do they produce in today's cultural and political landscape? The centrality of the clone figure in the works makes it useful to draw some parallels between Hal Fisher and Tom of Finland. However, the differences between the two should also be looked at. The most obvious of these have to do with the differences in artistic technique, drawings on the one hand, black and white photographs on the other. Consequently, the, albeit historically identifiable, depiction of sexual fantasies on the one hand and the documentation of a socio-historically specific lifestyle and urban, urban settings on the other. Hypermasculinity through exaggerated and probable physical proportions in Tom of Finland, a realism of almost average bodies in Fisher's work, for example, also in contrast to the sculpturally staged bodies in Robert Maplethorpe's work. However, both Tom of Finland and Hal Fisher are clearly about the gay appropriation of masculinity a crucial cultural technique of gay, gay subcultures. In the exclusive universe of Tom of Finland and Hal Fisher, whose archetypes, to use Fisher's language here, also owe much to the male-male communities of the cowboys um, or of the bucolic uh, utopias of Whitman and Thoreau from the 19th century or the biker gangs after World War II, flamboyant drag gestures have no place. Richard Meyer spoke here of homosexual manliness also another term for the clone, we might say. A strategy that affirms and exhibits the masculinity denied to gays and homophobic societies. A visibly powerful masculinity to which gays otherwise have no access is being celebrated as a value. A project that can also be understood psychosocially as a form of emancipation that grew out of the gay movement. For the configuration of gay sexuality, this also means gays turn themselves into the man they desire an achievement that I would not consider too small. Such affirmative body politics can lead to euphoria. Beyond trauma, a gay world of sexual happiness is celebrated, as many commentaries, especially about of Tom, Tom of Finland, are never tired of pointing out. In terms of queer and feminist politics, this, of course, immediately raises the question of how the access to the image of seemingly unchallenged masculinity that has now been worked out does not in turn make a pact with hegemonic forms of power. From the specifically male gay collapse of identification and desire, an almost crazy identification with masculinity can emerge, as Leo Bersani wrote, as we know. The inevitability of which is known as well as the problems that result from it. The possibilities of a critique inherent in a homosexual manliness have also been discussed since the 1980s. Uh, for example, in David Halperin or D.A. Miller. Bersani, in his celebration of the gay bottom, refers to a collapse of the masculine ego in gay anal sex. For him, without question, a scene of transformative value. For the most part, however, the critical potential of gay masculinities has been located less dramatically on the surface of the body and attached to the overtly signifying character of the images produced here. A perspective that assigns a semiotic and performative mobility to masculinity and gender that consequently leads to Jack Halberstam's position that the transgression of masculinity appears most powerful when it is enacted on the female body. As a repertoire of science, masculinity belongs to everyone who has the desire to make use of it, including trans men and gays. In the case of Tom of Finland, such a gesture of de-essentializing gender is realized in the stylistic device of phallic exaggeration with which the artificiality of the category masculinity is so obviously admitted, oversized cocks, balls, and asses, that no one would be tempted to misunderstand these fantastic creatures as an affirmation of natural masculinity. Hal Fisher's photos from the famous series uh, Gay Semiotics function differently. The selection and arrangement of body types, clothing, and accessories, Fisher shows us all the variations of the gay clone, proceeds almost encyclopedically and already underlines the performative character of masculinity as a semiotic game. In the photographs, the sexual value of the male body is confirmed and heightened by clothing, fetishes, and accessories. With this shift from the body to its symbolic nature, uh, the staged character of the images emerges. 
Masculinity is hardly understood here as a display of the physical body alone. Its materiality is not foregrounded, a concern of Bud Magazine, for example, which is one of my research interests, as Tim already announced, but rather produced in a specifically gay approach. One makes use of the archive of historical styles of sexualized masculinities. Fisher himself speaks of archetypes here and identifies five, classical, natural, western, urban, and leather. Archetypes are not initially disrupted here in their claim to validity, as the masculinities exhibition suggests in one of its chapters. This is a, a photo from the show in London but are identified individually, placed within a series and provided with metadata in a quasi-archival manner. The non-linguistic sign language of the clones is deciphered. With this decoding, a distancing is inscribed in the image in a kind of modernist gesture that both encourages imitation and thwarts the claim of authentic masculinity precisely through the instructional character of the images. Jonathan D. Katz uh, comments, quote, how Fisher gives the game away entirely when he offers the viewer tongue firmly in cheek a primer on gay male sociosexual codes, end of quote. For the clone documented by Fisher, both characteristics are decisive. The recognizable semiotic character of the gender design on the one hand and an insistence on masculinity as an erotic value on the other, and which appears to be non-negotiable, but is precisely the reason for the explanatory effort that is made here. Fisher's essays, essay accompanying the picture in gay semiotic says, quote, two aspects of gay culture are analyzed here. First, the male fantasy, archetypal gay images as they appear in both gay media and gay urban enclaves. Second, the invention of a semiotic mode within the gay community." End of quote. This combination of intentions in these pictures also reflects a specifically gay state of affect, for it is not least gays themselves who benefit from the deconstruction of masculinity. Masculinity is unconditionally affirmed as the currency of gay desire and at the same time made accessible to gays in an eclectic conception beyond nat natural authority. The designs of masculinity in Tom of Finland and Hal Fisher accomplish the feat of gloriously staging masculinity without simply repeating naturalized hetero masculinity. The supposed contradiction of masculinity and artificiality is being negotiated through the techniques of masculine drag. Hal Fisher's work does not submit to the spectacle of sexual pleasure that characterizes Tom of Finland's drawings and marks the kinship with pornography. Rather, Fisher's photographs and gay semiotics provide the technical preconditions of a gay desiring machine, its possibilities of interconnection. Fisher shows visual signs whose functioning is explained by inserted texts. This is what you have to do in order to become a, become a gay clone. In this way, the pics are also the document of a transition from pre-clone to clone. The men have done their homework. Now they're ready for action. The action itself we don't get to see. The mapping, mapping of the code has a very concrete use. Uh, signifiers exist for accessibility, Fisher writes in his essay. With the signifiers of gay fetish fashion, a language of desire is articulated that is purpose-bound. Fisher continues, quote, Obviously, one reason behind this is that gays are less constrained by a type of code which defines people of property of others or feels the need to promote monogamy, like the wedding ring, for example. Uh, I continue with the quote, gays have many more sexual possibilities than straight people and therefore need a more intricate communication system, end of quote. Beyond the construction of masculinity that takes place here, the semiotic character of the images thus documents a reliable language of desire whose dynamic certainly exceeds the ideology of the couple. It is also a language less concerned with the completeness of an image of masculinity, but rather provides clues for the performance of sexual acts. The male body is dissected rather than assembled, its possibilities of connecting multiplied. Yet essential for the sexual orientation of the clones is the distinction between left and right. Quote, in the gay semiotics, the body is divided into two sides, into sides, the left representing the aggressive, the right, the passive. The strict distinction between left and right is initially intended to guarantee a smooth pairing in which sexual expectations are fulfilled without having to give verbal explanation, like in a porn film. 
Desire needs no verbal language. As rigorous as the distinction between top and bottom may be, the number of signs as well as the signs themselves, one can always put the key or the handkerchief somewhere else, points to their general instability and circulation. Does such a semiotic system forcefully destabilize masculinity as an ideology of power? Fisher himself seems to be both skeptical and amused when he uh, comments, quote, interestingly, the handkerchief is seen more often on the left or active side and less frequently on the right or passive side because gays are often reluctant to advertise their passive tendencies. The structurally pluralistic hanky coat can be used to maintain the facade of a more unchallenged masculinity being a top and not a bottom, but at the cost of being left empty-handed or unable to play the desired role in sex. Fisher's images are a document of the post-Stonewall and pre-AIDS Western gay movement, which is part of what constitutes uh, the mythical status. Without question, Fisher's unique document of the construction of homosexual manliness prepared the possibility of deconstructing masculinity within queer theory, a project that until today has received far less attention uh, than the culture of female masculinity, for example. In my mind, Fisher's work is at least as important as Esther Newton's Mother Camp. While having become the default mode of gender studies, the critical value of the performativity paradigm has also been called into question more recently and parallel with its disciplinary triumph. I will only briefly mention one perspective here that seems interesting to me for assessing Fisher's somewhat contradictory position within the contemporary visual culture. In her analysis of the career of the label Cool in US pop and youth culture, Shannon Winnebst has pointed out the all too smooth compatibility of performative appropriations of bodily styles and gesture and market conforming commodifications. The register of the performative does not necessarily resist economic appropriation, in which case the specific history of a subculture threatens to fall by the wayside. In the case of Winnebst's analysis, the history of the persecution and discrimination of black people in US society and forms of resistance against them as expressed through a black culture of the cool. In the pop cultural circulation of coolness, few or no traces remain of this. Um, another example for this would be also, uh, for, for this particular would be the hipster and the discourse uh, of the hipster, how it emerged in Norman Mailer uh, in the late 1950s, for example. Attitude and gestures alone cannot fulfill this task. Here, the dynamics of performativity are a vehicle for an incorporation into the mainstream. On the one hand, it is true that Fisher's images resist such a form of appropriation through their obvious reference to gay sexuality and history, especially in the texts. Gay history itself hardly threatens to disappear with the circulation of the images, at least not as long as the written explanations are being kept. Yet, their illustration of the construction and deconstruction of masculinities also becomes the prerequisite for their popularity and in museums and in media culture, I think. Does the clone made a similar career as cool? In the last section of my talk, I want to further explore this question. Even before you give uh, away the secret of an acting desirable masculinity by explaining its code, the display of male bodies and nakedness alone does its work of questioning male authority. If the phallus can only exercise its power unrestrictedly as long as it is not shown, exposed masculinity leads to a break with a visual tradition that understands the man as the bearer of the gaze and the woman as its object. The job of reversing this visual order falls to feminist critique as much as to gay men. Quote, long before the current women's journals began picturing naked men as sex objects, gay magazines were exploring aspects of male eroticism, Fisher writes. 45 years after Fisher's work and after Laura Mulvey, the question can be raised about the yield of a gay and feminist visual politics that has worked to stabilize, destabilize a sexist and homophobic regime of the gays. How effective has such a critique been? To what extent has it been represented in the public sphere? Chris Haywood is optimistic in his essay in the exhibition catalog of masculinities. Quote, if masculinity works best when it is unnamed and unseen, then this exhibition uncovers and shines a light on the ways in which being a man and having masculinity can otherwise be thought, of, thought about, affirmed, practiced, and contested, end of quote. 
Wolfgang Tillmanns in a discussion of Bud magazine for which he was a signature, signature photographer, as Bruce LaBruce writes, notes that he still considers this project unfinished. unfinished. Pictures of naked men always serve a purpose, Tillmanns says. Jonathan D. Katz contextualizes this gay, queer, or feminist cultural work. For him, the work in the Masculinities exhibition, which includes Hal Fisher's gay semiotics, are characterized by a general transness. He writes, every work in this exhibition, talking about masculinities, is transmasculine. If by that we mean that they examine masculinity critically, underscoring its unnaturalness, its constructiveness in and through the social. Katz adds to this by now almost, um, to this by now almost commonsensical argument in a way that seems to me to be crucial. But this queering of masculinity would have remained a largely subcultural project, an aspect of queer culture alone, were it not for the fortitious convergence of this new critique with a seismic shift in the image of masculinity in dominant cultures as well." End of quote. No longer an exceptional subcultural position as it was for Fisher 45 years ago, transness is understood by Katz as a general condition of masculinity in the present, a discursive constitution that has spread through social and cultural history and affects the bodies of trans men as well as of cis men. Western societies have deciphered the cultural techniques of producing masculinity like Fisher and translated them into an accessible principle. Similar to Vinib's reading of performing coolness and Katz's reading, this means the acknowledgement of the visual coding of the male body has become mainstream. Codifiability paves the way for commodification. 21st century capitalism offers commodification of the male body as well as the female body. According to a general principle of transness, the male body exposed to the gaze and classified would be both constructible and consumable. Producibility and consumer consumerability are the principles of a saturated masculinity, as John Mercer has diagnosed for pop and porn culture as a general diversification of masculinity. Without question, such a culture of masculinity is a gain over historical and political cultures that still aim to enforce the truth and the claim to power of a masculinity that pretends to be able to follow the imperative of authenticity without question. Contemporary political cultures offer enough examples for the return of the strongman. Moreover, queer and gender studies themselves, and especially the forms of activism they produce, are not immune against the essentializing effects of identity politics. A reminder of the fundamental constructedness of gender, masculinity in particular from 45 years ago, seems politically like a very timely and needed gesture. Therefore, I would not easily tick off the critical potential of images of masculinity that openly admit the fact of their constructedness, even if it is a critique that in the meantime also serves the rules of the market. Before I will return to the question of what it means for the display, and also come to the end, uh, uh, for the display of gay men's bodies in the museum space, let's briefly consider these diverging and intersecting lines of power with the contemporary cultural sphere by having a brief look at the video House of Air by Australian singer-songwriter Brendan McLean. He acknowledges the fact that Fisher's work, uh, uh, by the way, that was banned from uh, YouTube but is uh, available on Vimeo, and there was therefore a, a longer discussion around it. Uh, he, McLean, acknowledges the fact that Fisher's work has gone through several rounds of sub and pop cultural recyclings. In it, he demonstrates that Fisher's coding decoding contains ironic or parodistic potential, the stuff for entertainment. Here comes his update of Fisher's work.
<laughs> and you got the idea <laughs> and can watch the whole thing on uh, Vimeo. <laughs> um, the video, <laughs> the video House of Air by Brandon McLean turns Fisher's lexicon of gay sex into the material for parody. Only what is already established can be parodied, obviously. However, there are a few important differences to Fisher's work from 45 years ago. The joke of the video is that the sign language of gays is not only explained as in Fisher's work, but directly spelled out. Um, so all the sexual actions, rooming, fucking, fisting, uh, signaled by the hanky coat, are edited together here, one after the other, in moving images, almost like an amalgamation of Fisher and Tom of Finland. This is done in a manner close to slapstick as the gestures and facial expressions of the very first scene with the, with the ice cream already announce. The sex scenes between men in this video are hardly put in, into the picture as erotically valid material. They are not pictures of desire, they are gay porn parody. The video, however, does not stop at the fluids and excretions that the male body produces and to which the hanky coat with its clean, even ironed and neatly arranged handkerchiefs refers, come, piss, and also shit. These are used in the video like special effects of a splatter film. The cum shot and um, I think is fake uh, with the piss. I think the piss is not fake, but it's maybe also difficult to um, determine that here precisely. Um, I don't find any of these scenes shocking, but I find them surprising in the context of a social media world that in parts also follows a logic of overbidding the outrageous or disgusting, this video then again is probably well placed. I come to my conclusion. To wrap up, as a document, Fisher's images represent a post Stonewall moment of gay culture. They also offer an important connection to, pre, to a pre-AIDS world. His work displays both the construction of masculinity and a visual code for gay men to communicate their desire. This photographic work is an essential archive for gender and queer theories approach to the essentialized notions of gender and sexuality, which tend to neglect the investigation of homosexual maleness, for which the clone is an example. Both Fisher's pictures and dominant theories of gender and sexuality need to be historicized. For a contemporary culture of diversity and saturated masculinity, they represent more of a blueprint than a way of dismantling its forms. While they are certainly effective as a means against nostalgic returns to masculinist ideologies of strongmen, and also an urgent reminder of the merely strategic use of identity politics within queer cultures, they fit quite smoothly into a pop, pop cultural world and its demand for entertainment. Additionally, they deliver an early recipe for commodification that is now ubiquitous in gay sexual worlds online. That Fisher's photographs, like Tom of Finland's drawings, have made their way into big collections and important exhibitions testifies to their canonical status beyond the gay world. With them, a gay male visual tradition whose protagonist is the clone has received its space within the art history of the past 50 years. Curiously, Fisher's instruction for sexual acts between gay men stops at the sexual act itself. To be sure, this also facilitated the success of the images in the mainstream. They are not threatening a clever trick to pitchfork gay images into broader circulation. Still, with them, the museum space proves to be a site of contestation. The historical distance to the 19, to 1970s San Francisco and the contemporary culture of diversification and saturated masculinity has paved the way for the existence of these images in exhibitions and collections. While this cultural history and context tends to flatten the exceptional status of these pictures today, the urgent project of making masculinity accessible for gay men and disrupting the hegemonic power of the masculine can still be mobilized against a political and cultural present that acts as if these images and the queer work they do never existed. Fisher's photographs remind us of the ways in which gay men helped us to see and understand the construction of masculinities. Today they raise the question what it would mean to surpass such a project. What would be disturbing uh, unsettling forms of masculinity and maleness that not only illustrate the laws of the market, but also disrupt them. Brandon McLean's House of Air, a parodic commentary on Fisher, makes us wonder whether the universe of digital entertainment culture has an outside or whether it can swallow just about everything. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, I have I have many thoughts, but I would like to um, open the floor to questions, and I'm going to bring this microphone to you for your question. As you digest <laughs> and try to swallow what Peter has just given us. I mean, I found it, Peter, um, incredibly useful what you were saying in terms of thinking historically about the difference in the 1970s, the moment, that, that moment where we were in gay culture, in sexual culture, and where the broader culture was in, in the 1970s when Hal produced that work and how it signifies now. And that's something I've... Um, wanted to think about, but haven't got very far in thinking about with the exhibition, but you've given us a whole kind of vocabulary and template for thinking that, and I, I appreciate that. I think this, I think it's important. Um, it was a great way to begin the conversation. Um, I also particularly appreciated what you said about um, the idea of masculine drag. Um, and the idea which we could extend, including in Hal's work, to the idea that masculine drag um, is performed even when men are naked, which they mostly are not, but sometimes are in Hal's work, right? That, that kind of denaturalization all the way down, I think that's important um, to bear in mind. Those are just remarks as people uh, digest I feel, I feel a question coming, yes. The question is gonna be asked by Jeannie Brinkema. Thank you, Tim, um, and thank you, Peter, for this talk, which I really enjoyed, and uh, we've already spoken about the video, which I think is interesting to the end. <laughs> and it sort of comes to its culmination, uh, scatological. I was just like looking at Tim. And right? formally, yes. Um, so here's my question. You had this really interesting comment that in Hal's work, it's not about sexual pleasure, it's the technical precondition of interconnection. Yeah. So I want to sort of sit with that for a moment and then also think about House of Air, which is clearly coming from the moment of the prep generation, right? So what we're missing um, would be a generation where we might see something like fisting, but it would be in a pedagogical context, right? That's what, that's what porn might have looked like in the 80s and 90s, pedagogical with the specter of, of health and, and death sort of coloring what it means to instruct in safe or safer practices. So I guess my question is, if all we have is the precondition for interconnection, and then later we have the parody of porn, where is there a site for pleasure? Like where, where does that go? Does it have to go to the pedagogical sort of pornographic moment, which itself is so tinged with, with trauma and anxiety, but also care and kinship? Or does it have to go somewhere else altogether? Thank you, that's a brilliant question. Um, I mean, you know, if one, my first attempt would be to respond to that uh, with the history of pornography and pornographic aesthetics, because as we know, uh, starting particularly in the 80s and all through the 90s, we did have a certain uh, style of masculinity within commercial porn that emphasized the health and the fitness of the male bodies, right? So that the specter of AIDS would be completely removed from this um, offer of visual pleasure. So, which again testifies to your, um, or, or which kind of uh, underlines the, the problem that you have been pointing out, you know, that there is a gap between these two forms of representation and the commercial porn is not really delivering either. So, um, I have to think about this a little bit more, but in my universe and my um, gay and queer world, um, uh, but but magazine. This is this sounds a bit cheap now that I'm coming up here with but as the solution to this question. But um, uh, but magazine does some of this cultural work for me, and it does that. Um, well, it does that because it manages to move away uh, from certain uh, visual regimes of uh, uh, of a pornography of fitness of the 80s and 90s, and after the introduction of combination therapy in 1996, it was possible to have a different understanding of the male body and of male desire and of male intimacy. So I think that the catalog of pictures that Butt offers us is a direction to go if we want to pursue that question. Question being asked by John Rico. 
Hi, thanks, Peter, um, for that great presentation. Um, kind of conflating Jeannie's question with Tim's uh, remarks, it makes me think that the this precondition that you're talking about, which I think actually has something to do with my talk on uh, the, uh, the prefatory, um, has a historical dimension. That there's a way in which the 70s represents that precondition of sex and sexuality. A return, you know, post-liberation, pre-AIDS, that is happening now, maybe enabled by certain things. Um, so I wonder whether you see, you know, even this exhibition and this symposium as part of a more general uh, turn to the 70s uh, these days. Uh, I mean, I think this, this point has been made in other contexts, right? There does seem to be this kind of turn to the 70s, and I wonder whether that itself becomes, you know, that there's the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, I mean, if we think about this in terms of the emergence of uh, queer, uh, gay, sexual cultures, um, you know, on that level, that is certainly the case, you know, with um, with the PrEP generation, let's just say, and treatment as prevention. So, you know, so everything has changed, say, in 2009, 2010, 2012. Um, and, and also, we do get, um, I mean, and this is something, you know, I'm saying more from my position at Schulz Museum, we do get, of course, um, uh, plenty of, of, of uh, different aesthetic responses now to this situation. So um, in that sense, I would agree with you. However, I would also say that, that, that the, the significance, let's just say, of PrEP, in my mind, has not been adequately acknowledged. I think people have not publicly spoken about it enough, or I think I think that this culture or this return to the 70s does exist as a, as a subculture, um, as in forms of practices, um, also in conjunction with new media. Obviously, you know, the whole question of pig subjectivity, uh, the whole question of chemsex, and I mean, these are different strains of this phenomenon, but this is something Joao has probably more to say about. Um, I think that is true, and that is um, a reality, a historical re reality right now. Still, um, in, f in terms of like a, a, a theoretical discourse, or also in terms of, say, political activism bound to it, um, these responses have not been adequately to this uh, paradigmatic shift, I think. John's, <coughs> John's question, help to articulate a sense, a dark sense, that I have had um, recently, which is that despite all the agency and work that I individually have put into the exhibition and into this symposium, I have had a feeling that I'm somehow um, emerging as a kind of what Antoinette Burton calls a symptom of culture, um, that there is something uh, beyond my agency involved in this, there is something symptomatic in what we are doing, which is not exactly the terms you were using, but um, is retranslated into other terms. <clears throat> in this return to that moment in the 70s. Other questions? Hal is saving his remarks for the final moment. Um, yes, Mariam. Mariam Kashani asking the question. Hey, thank you for a great presentation. I was wondering if you could just say more about that final music video. Um, because I, I'm with so much that it offered, it left much to be desired. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to hear more about sort of the differences of what's happening. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, to be honest, I, I only discovered it quite recently. And, um, but since I was so interested in the, yeah, I mean, to not just uh, locate or decipher uh, Hal's work um, historically, but also think about its place um, 
you know, both in the context of exhib exhibitions, but also newer media, I felt like I, I, um, I really wanted to have it in it as a commentary. I mean, the, the, the weird thing about it is, and we had this discussion yesterday over dinner, is um, as explicit as it is, it's also really, um, well, how should I put it? <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's not erotic. It's not arousing, right? It's like, it's, it's from the very start, the tone is set um, about how this is a parody of porn. Um, and I have, uh, honestly, I also have a lot of questions around it. For example, I don't see any connection between the video and the lyrics. I, I, House of Air, I, what, I don't know, <laughs> you know, there is, there is um, which is maybe great, but it's so, it's not, it doesn't seem not to be like an illustration of the uh, lyrical narration at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I guess, you know, the, the thing, the, the, one of the questions I would like to follow up uh, um, thinking about this more is how this video, um, makes sense or, you know, also became possible in the context of YouTube culture and tube monsters and a certain um, culture of the grotesque and the disgusting that emerged in social media. So in, if, if one looks at it from that perspective of uh, social media um, content, I think it's not so uh, surprising, right? It's, it's, it's almost generic in its, in its uh, use of, uh, of, uh, of, of matter and, uh, and, and the way that it is crass, yeah. But I mean, this, this, this video is well known. Maybe there's other people here that also have things to say about the video and the background of the video that they want to share. Oh, if I may, just briefly. Yeah, I, I too, Peter, just discovered it recently. And I think it's interesting how like that contemporary video finds itself and its genre and idiom by going back to the 70s. But for some of us of a certain age and orientation, we find the contemporary video through Hal's work. Yes. <laughs> you know, it was yes. only yes. by preparing for my talk exactly. that I discovered the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's because I'm clueless when it comes no, no, to no. certain I kinds mean, of things. I mean, exactly the same so here. You know, yeah. I was talking to a friend over dinner about this presentation, and then, oh, there's this video. And you could, you know, while we were at the Chinese restaurant, he popped up the video and watched it. <laughs> Say your name before you ask the question. Okay, Ian Wayne. Uh, okay, two questions. First, uh, you know, what, what do you think, uh, um, from your point of view, what the video trying to do? What to, the video is trying to do? Right. To promote or to publicize uh, behavior, uh, social culture, subculture, or something else? That's the first question. Okay, and then second question, uh, we have been asking this question and they never got the answer and I don't think there's an answer. You know, where to draw the line put between art and the, uh, pornography? Okay, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I, uh, let me try to say a few things about your first question. There was a moment when I wasn't sure whether the video is homophobic, whether the slapstick and the, the parodistic tone of it, you know, makes fun of gay sex in a way that is not really sympathetic. Um, and I haven't fully decided yet. I think that I think there's a homo, there's a possibility of a homophobic uh, reading of that uh, that video. And also, um, you know, precisely in the ways in which it also um, avoids um, gay desire in a certain sense, right? Um, so the um, well, I in my in my con in the context of my reading, I used it. Uh, I was I was mostly interested in the question in the in the in the, in the fact that such a parody is possible, you know in the first place, so that um, Hal's work is so ubiquitous or has been so established in the way that it functions that you can top it by producing such a video. So that was the question I was interested in. How it, um, how it circulates, um, uh, what's the audience for that? Um, these are questions I cannot answer, I, I don't know, I don't know. Um, 
about the about the second question. <laughs> 30 seconds to answer the question about the <laughs> distinction between art and pornography. I mean, I could quite simply see it, say for me porn is always art, but that's also not quite true. And I, I don't know, I can, maybe we can chat about this later. I can, uh, it's difficult for me to, to answer that here, you know, in just a few seconds. Uh, yeah. I just go back to the first question. Uh, people asked this uh, before, um, I came from China. And uh, uh, I left China in the 80s. But uh, when I left the China at that time, uh, homosexual was illegal. Not just be illegal, it was a crime and a punishable a crime. If someone got discovered uh, had uh, homosexual uh, actions, whatever, behavior, and could be put in jail. That was uh, before I left China for Oxford. Um, I don't know what's the situation now. And then, then so go back to your, your, uh, some other people's question. Historically, uh, we know in this country, United States, uh, and uh, in recent, uh, in 21st century, started the legalization of gay rights and so on and so forth. And uh, then if, if the homosexual, according to your you know, talk, some of them, uh, you know, it's a precondition, it's, a, it's a biological rather than uh, social behavior. And then do you see any difference or fundamental changes after in Western countries or whatever country if the uh, gay marriage and gay rights uh, uh, legalized. So, so is any, any difference before legalization and after legalization of gay rights? Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> many, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, sure how to relate this to what I presented here because this is such a big question. Um, yeah. We can, I can, maybe we can chat about this later. These are, these are, these are big, these are very large and important questions and I think I'm going to use the fact that I have a microphone in my hand to, to um, thank Peter for a terrific presentation and move us on and after the second paper we will take a short break um, but let's 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 move on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.